Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation on managing uh, airport hazards uh, presented by the Ohio Fish and Wildlife Management Association, the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, and the Ohio Chapter of the Wildlife Society. Before we get into the presentation, I want to uh, give you guys uh, a reminder of our next presentation coming up on April 8th at 10 a.m. Mike Tonkovich with the Ohio Division of Wildlife is going to be giving an overview of Ohio's deer management program. Uh, you can register for that um, hopefully by the end of the week you, by going to the website at the bottom of the screen, obcinet.org forward slash OFWPS. While you're at that website, you can also see our past webinars, uh, and um, there we provide a link to the recording of all of those webinars, and so you can see them in case you missed them. But let's move on to the reason you guys are here today, um, our presentation by John Sepek with the USDA Wildlife Services. John is a district supervisor for USDA Wildlife Services in Northern Ohio. He is a native of Ohio and studied coyotes in Ohio for his graduate work. John's current work involves protecting native habitat and species and health <laughs> by alleviating wildlife conflict at airports and managing deer, feral swine, and mute swans in northern Ohio. John has been married for 15 years and has a 10-year-old son and twin 8-year-old daughters. He recently retired from the Ohio Army National Guard after 23 years of active, um, of active duty, including deployments in Iraq and, a and Afghanistan. He is currently spending his spare time transitioning from military duties to leading Boy Scouts and coaching youth sports. Uh, so, John, I'm going to turn this over to you. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And along those lines, I just have to warn everyone, because of the Boy Scout camp out, I'm, I'm losing my voice, uh, So as it always happens when you give a, a presentation. So if I put, have to put people on mute. But um, good morning. I'd like to thank the OFWMA for this opportunity. Um, it to you know present this information to you today and I'll be talking about wildlife on airports obviously but it, it's a very challenging situation and it's not just challenging for the airport or the FAA um, but for wildlife professionals and why we're here you know the civil and military aviation communities have long recognized that the the threat from aircraft collisions with wildlife it, it is very real and it's increasing but for many of us in the wildlife field this this is not something we are familiar with or that we learned about in college. So my intent today is to give an overview of the hazards associated with wildlife on airports, uh, some background on airport operations and FAA, gu FAA guidance, uh, to wildlife management on airports in perspective, and illustrate a few principles, techniques, and methods used in managing wildlife on airports. When our agency certifies our, world, our wildlife personnel to work on airports, or when we teach airport operations personnel about wildlife management, it is usually a one to three day course. So I'm going to do my very best today to consolidate high points from these programs so that you can have an overall awareness of not only the unique challenges of conducting um, our profession, assuming the audience today is composed of wildlife professionals, but conducting our profession on airports, but also so that you can consider wildlife management within the context of running an airport. Also, please bear with me today as the online program we are using doesn't allow the presenter to, to use timing or animations, which I normally do, to go through bullet points or pictures. So most of these slides simply static pictures, and I'll be talking through the points as we go. As wildlife professionals, we know how complex wildlife management can be. Uh, our decisions do not just involve the species itself. Management plans must meet federal and state regulations. They must be in compliance with National Environmental Policy Act. They need to involve the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or state EPA in regards to waterways and wetlands. Proper permits for all aspects need to be in place. Proper certification licensing of those involved. This in, in addition to considering and involving landowners, uh, whether it is public land like state forests or, or federal wilderness areas or privately owned land as our private lands biologists know. Wildlife management is not simply about that species alone, and we know that. But I would like you to consider the airport's perspective um, in dealing with wildlife. Managing an airport is a complex process. This involves not just the general airport operations staff, but air traffic control, ground and air communications, airport rescue and firefighting, security, instrument landing systems, runway lighting, runway safety, 
maintenance, snow removal, de-icing for our northern airports as we witness. Um, each of these have their own set of regulations and oversight by the Federal Aviation Administration and State Department of Transportation. So wildlife is, is only one small aspect of airport operations. Keep this in the back of your mind as I'm going through this, that it's from this airport's perspective because they're responding to those regulations about wildlife hazards. But wildlife on an airport can be a very significant concern with catastrophic results. This was demonstrated by, uh, by Canada Geese that brought down Flight 1549. And there is a concern with instrument landing system, with runway lighting, with communication. It often can be immediately addressed by, the, by airport personnel. As wildlife professionals know well enough, animals are unpredictable, uh, dynamic, and adaptable, and their behavior makes wildlife ma management a very challenging situation. However, this is, this is not a new issue. The first recorded aircraft flight occurred with the Wright brothers on 17 December 1903 in North Carolina. The first recorded bird strike was also with the Wright brothers, but it was here in Ohio on 7 September 1905 near Dayton. The first recorded human fatality from wildlife with aircraft uh, was in 1912, and um, a pilot by the name of uh, Calbraith Rogers was uh, conducting a cross-continent flight and a goal became entangled in uh, the wiring in his plane. He wasn't able to control the plane, and, and it crashed into, into the surf, and he perished as a result. So not a new problem, but as we evolve and deal with this problem, um, and as a result of the hazards of aircraft striking wildlife, which I will refer to as wildlife strikes, uh, the FAA, who's the federal agency responsible for aviation safety, initiated a memorandum of understanding and interagency agreement with USDA Wildlife Services to provide technical and direct management assistance, conduct research to develop methods, and develop a database of recorded wildlife strikes. So for those of you unfamiliar with USDA Wildlife Services, or who wonder why the U.S. Department of Agriculture is involved in managing wildlife on airports, as I did when I joined our agency. Let me explain. USDA Wildlife Services is the federal government's wildlife damage management agency. Our mission is to resolve human-wildlife conflicts through research, technical assistance, and applied management. This includes minimizing the effect of wildlife damage on agriculture, industry, natural resources, and to safeguard public health and human safety. Public health and human safety includes our work with wildlife diseases and also in the area of aviation safety. Since the FAA's uh, Memorandum of Understanding and Agreement with uh, Wildlife Services, our agency's work on airport has increased as shown by this graph. In 2013, Wildlife Services provided 251 staff years worth of technical and direct management assistance to reduce wildlife hazards at 850 airports which included civil, joint military use, and military airports in all 50 U.S. states, three U.S. territories, and nine foreign countries. Just to give you an idea of some scope of this. Wildlife Services conducted a certification personnel, uh, or conducts a certification personnel um, for our personnel that, that begin to work on airports. Wildlife biologists conducting wildlife hazard assessments under the FAA um, or presenting uh, training for airport personnel actively involved in implementing FAA-approved hazard assessments must have professional training and or experience in wildlife hazard management at airports. And that's an FAA citation um, right out of a reg. What this means is these personnel that work on these airports have to have the academic coursework to uh, meet a federal 46 wildlife biologist requirements or the certified wildlife biologist requirements by the, the Wildlife Society to take and, and pass an airport wildlife hazard management training course, as I mentioned, uh, by the FAA, and uh, conduct a wildlife hazard assessment, and then go through refresher training. So it's not just simply throwing someone out on an airport because it's a unique environment, as I mentioned. In addition, when you're a wildlife professional working on an airport, often there are those airport requirements. Uh, they're not going to just let you roll around on the runways or taxiways. So most airports require driving on runways and taxiways, communicating with air traffic control training, in addition to security background checks and airport badging before personnel can even begin to work on an airport. As I mentioned earlier, our agreement with the FAA involves developing methods to reduce wildlife hazards. This is done primarily through USDA Wildlife Services Research Wing, the National Wildlife Research Center, 
and it's primarily done at the Ohio Field Station uh, here in Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, their approaches to reducing wildlife strikes with aircraft primarily fall um, under one or more of the following research areas, habitat management, wildlife dispersal, removal, and exclusion, detection, prediction of wildlife movements and behaviors so that aircraft can avoid high-risk activities, both temporally and spatially, and manipulating visual stim stimuli, for example, aircraft landing lights to enhance the detection and avoidance of aircraft by birds. I think the best way to explain some of their research areas, rec recent ones, are, are to read off a few of the recent publications, one of which is a framework for managing airport grasslands and birds amidst, uh, amidst conflicting priorities, another exploiting avian vision with aircraft lighting to reduce bird strikes, uh, exploiting anti-predator behavior in white-tailed deer for resource protection, foraging preferences of Canada geese among turf grasses, implications for reducing human goose conflicts, and I'll talk about that later in detail, and interspecific variation of wildlife hazards to aircraft. So they do a great job up here uh, conducting research in these areas uh, to include uh, using cutting-edge satellite tele telemetry, uh, to look at bird usage of air, airports and to understand um, how they're not only using air, airport space, but also with some of our relocation efforts, what's going on with those species that we try to move off airports. And, and a lot of work recently in you know, studying the visual systems of, of birds and how birds respond to light cues, as I mentioned. This is also looking at um, how bird, a lot, a lot of behavioral research in how, how different species react to the approach of an oncoming vehicle. Um, with, you know, because if they have a certain behavior and they're responding to that, how can you take that into effect when you're trying to change the lighting on an aircraft or when you're looking at predictability of a species when found in an airport with different types of aircrafts, their approach and departure speeds in areas like that. Uh, I would encourage you to contact the National Wildlife Research Center in here in Sandusky uh, if you have questions about that. We also um, maintain the FAA's wildlife strike database here in Sandusky, Ohio, and uh, as we mentioned in our agreement with the FAA. This data is managed uh, in a database in conjunction with Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. There are currently um, over 148,000 reported wildlife strikes in this database. Annually, the FAA and Wildlife Services produces a report that summarizes all strike data since 1990, as uh, mentioned by the, or as illustrated by the picture on the right. Uh, additionally, the FAA also has an agreement with the Smithsonian Feather Identification Lab to assist with unidentified wildlife strike remains that are submitted by personnel working on airports. Often there is very little material that is recovered from a bird strike, and the Smithsonian Lab uses microscopic features of the downy part of feathers or DNA analysis to identify that, that species of bird. So we have that, in, uh, that information to put in the database and uh, to help us make our management decisions. Through the data collected in the National Wildlife Strike Database, we can see that the number of recorded wildlife strikes are on the rise. The number of reported wildlife strikes to civil aircraft in the U.S. has increased 5.8-fold from 1,851 in 1990 to a record 10,726 in 2012, for a total of 131,096 strikes from, from in this period. This, is, this chart illustrates that information, and it, it is from the the latest report that has been published, the 2012 Annual Strike Report. These strikes involved uh, 127,000 birds, uh, almost 3,000 terrestrial mammals, 782 bats, and 156 reptiles. Birds were involved in obviously, you know, the majority of these strikes, but as we go through this, you'll see that there are significant implications both from birds and mammals uh, when we look at size, which we'll talk about on the next slide. As we know, many populations of large bird and mammals have increased markedly in the last few decades and adapted to living in urban environments, which includes airports. Uh, for an example, Dave Sherman from ODNR, Division of Wildlife, uh, recently gave a talk about this in Ohio titled The Comeback Kids, and he explained how Ohio eagles, ospreys, cranes, and cormorants were on the rise in Ohio. Resident Canada geese population, as wildlife professionals, it, it, it is obvious that we know many species are on the rise. This may not be so obvious to, to airport officials, but I, so I just, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I, I wanted to discuss this, and, and for example, let's look at deer. Um, this graph shows white-tailed deer population increasing, you know, from 
about 350,000 in 1900 to over 28 million in 2010. Well, from 1990 to 2010, there were 925 white-tailed deer strikes. 772 of these caused damage, with the total destruction of 18 aircraft, one human fatality, and 25 human injuries. This resulted in over 31 million in resulting damage nationally. This slide shows the seven highest costs associated with wildlife strikes, specifically in Ohio from 1990 through 2012. This includes both military and civilian reported strikes. There have been 4,468 reported wildlife strikes in Ohio, 93 of which involved substantial damage, total direct damage over almost $16 million. For this figure, I, I grouped gulls because often in the strike reports, gulls are just reported as gulls, not necessarily broken out into herring or ring build. But for the gull figure, almost $5 million, I, I, I can break that out. Ring bills were over 1.2 million and herring gulls were almost $150,000. Unidentified gulls, just simply reported as gulls, were almost $3.5 million. Canada geese resulted in over $2.5 million in direct damage costs in the, during this period. Red tail hawks, over $1.5 million. White tail deer, uh, almost $1.4 million. Morning doves, 1.2, and it, it goes on, including starlings, mallards, widgeons, and I, if you go on down the list. This data is uh, available through the strike database, as I mentioned. Talking about this data, it, it all shows us that wildlife strikes are an increasing problem for aviation. This does not just involve repairs and simple damage costs, but sometimes the complete destruction of aircraft and human injuries and loss of life. Globally, wildlife strikes killed more than 250 people and destroyed over 229 aircraft since 1988. In the U.S., there have been 24 human fatalities from 10 different strikes with civil aircraft between 1990 and 2012. This involved seven fatalities from five, from five different strikes attributed to unknown bird, a fatality from a white-tailed deer from a brown pelican, five fatalities from a single strike of an American white pelican, which I'll talk about um, with the lower right-hand picture, two fatalities from Canada East, and eight fatalities from a single strike from a red-tailed hawk. These pictures illustrate some examples of this. The upper left picture uh, on 22 September, <coughs> September 1995, a United States Air Force uh, E-3 Century hit Canada geese on departure in Alaska, in Alaska with the loss of all 24 personnel on board. Now notice that this was a military ship. The aircraft lost power from uh, two, air, two engines and crashed into a wood, wooded area less than a mile from the end of the runway. Picture in the upper right was uh, from October of 1960 and involved uh, a Lockheed 188 Electra, which crashed on takeoff from, from Boston, Massachusetts after ingesting European Starlings in three of its four engines. 62 of 72 people on board were killed in the accident. Why I put this picture on is to highlight that it's not just larger birds or larger animals that um, oftentimes smaller birds can have significant results when colliding with aircraft, especially flocking ones and in the case of Starlings that have dense bodies. Uh, the result in a significant impact. More recent example is the, is the picture on the lower left. This is uh, from South Carolina in 2012. A Cessna 550 struck a deer just after touchdown. The deer struck the left leading edge of the left wing above the left main landing gear and ruptured an adjacent fuel cell. The aircraft was destroyed in the resulting blaze. Pilot and passenger got out safely. There were no injuries. In, uh, in the lower right hand picture, a uh, Cessna 500 citation uh, crashed in a woodlot shortly after takeoff in, Oco in Oklahoma in March of 2008. Analysis of the route uh, remains recovered by USDA biologists under direction of the NTSB indicated that the aircraft had struck at least one American pelican, and that's the, the five fatalities that I mentioned earlier as a result of a white pelican. So, though I, I asked you earlier in the talk to consider the airport's perspective and the I want to uh, mention here, from the wildlife perspective, these are not just a, a significant increasing problem for aviation, but there are obvious significant problems for wildlife. Animals don't often survive strikes with aircraft. The picture on, on the left is of a bald eagle that went through the fuselage of a C-130 military aircraft in Washington State in 2005. 
The picture on the right is of a bald eagle strike uh, that it struck a single engine plane in northeast Ohio in April of 2010. The strike resulted in damage to the fuselage, windshield, and nose of the aircraft, in addition to pilot and passenger received minor injuries. Regardless of damage to aircraft, these strikes normally result, as I mentioned, in the death of the bald eagle, which is a significant concern to us as wildlife professionals. The FAA enforces federal aviation safety regulations. So I want everyone to be aware that there is a code of federal regulations for airports that maintain a certificate with the FAA that says each certificate holder shall take immediate action to alleviate wildlife hazards when they are detected. So right up front, it is an airport's responsibility under federal regulations to take action when hazardous wildlife are on airports. There is also allowance for lethal removal of hazardous species on airports through, the fe through federal depredation orders, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service depredation permits, and in Ohio through Ohio Nuisance Animal Regulations and Ohio Division of Wildlife Special Permits. These are situations different than normal nuisance, crop damage, or management permits, and, and these are based on the impacts to health and safety. So there are times when lethal removal must occur for some species that are an immediate threat and it must be removed because there are no other management options. However, though this may be justified for an immediate threat, it is also often a temporary solution and the long-term solution should deal with the reason why the wildlife on the airport are on the airport and co conflicting with aircraft movement. I will get into this in more detail uh, throughout my, the rest of my talk. But to talk about the reason why they're there, it's very important for us to understand how attractive an airport can be to wildlife. Simply, airports equal attractive habitat. Uh, there are often resources in the airport environment that provide food, water, or cover, and I'm going to talk about these as I go. But out of necessity, airports are located in metropolitan areas near waterways and, and other travel corridors. It belongs to a port authority, and it was you know, historically through transportation processes where the locations of the airport are uh, ends up uh, resulting in some of the wildlife issues we deal with. And, and one other thing is that as the the urban areas or the areas that become urbanized around airports, you know, the airport ends up being attractive green space habitat in dense urban landscapes. Many airports are also located on wetlands before the times of wetland protection or delineation. They're often uh, built, as I mentioned, uh, in our ways, coast near rivers or transportation hubs. And these, these are, are the things that are associated with wildlife travel corridors and, and migratory routes. So, this is going to be some pretty basic stuff to begin with, especially for wildlife professionals. But, but I'm going to go through these so we can start thinking about what are the unique attractants on an airport. So, so you know, first off, this may not be obvious to an airport that natural habitat is going to draw wildlife in. You know, when they're looking at landscape or just simply a, a woodlot or um, grass that, that, that hasn't been maintained, they don't understand that, you know, wildlife are looking at this as a habitat. And especially on smaller airports that may not have a maintenance budget of, of like large airports, this is, is often a bigger problem. I want you to consider all of these things again from the airport's perspective as I'm going through the next few slides. Those may be, you know, somewhat obvious to us as wildlife professionals. So man-made attractants on or near an airport, and we know if you're, if you're involved in nuisance wildlife or wildlife damage management that uh, most everything can be an attractant for something that when uh, it involves humans. But picture on the left of a, a pond or a retention basin um, or found, you know, fountains or landscaping, all of these structures, these, these are the things that result in wildlife being attractive to the airport. The one that may not be obvious though um, or wasn't foreseen is the, the picture on the right of the a canopy there. There's a canopy that was put up in an airport and it was put up at decorative to look nice to offer protection from passengers coming and going from the airport but it resulted in you know offering warmth and shelter for roosting starlings and which had significant risk to the airport. This is also the case with airplane hangars, instrument landing equipment, uh, radar or air traffic control towers that offer areas for birds to nest or perch, or equipment and aircraft that aren't being used often become, you know, the obvious sparrow, pigeon, or starling homes. Airports, like many places, usually offer some sort of food source for wildlife. 
I'm not going to even try and say some of these are natural and some are man-made and next use lives because in an airport most food sources are have an anthropogenic influence anyway. But the, sometimes the food source is year-round and difficult to manage and is in the case of the peregrine falcon feeding on waterfowl on the left, which I will talk about in detail later in my talk. The picture on the right is of a muskrat carcass on an airport. This is the result of bald eagles actively feeding on muskrats in a wet area in an airport. When working with the airport and wondering why the eagle was persistently using the airport not responding to harassment, we didn't realize this was the food source. It was after, and it really was the muskrats that needed to be managed. But uh, I also have to note that eagles really like large open spaces, and airports offer those, and they often just loaf in these, loaf in these areas for no apparent reason. Sometimes the food source is, is seasonal or triggered by other events. The picture on the, on the left is of, uh, of midges. And anybody who has been to Cedar Point in the summertime in Ohio or on Lake Erie in the summer, they can tell you, you know, these midge outbreaks can be uh, quite a significant event. Well, gulls love them. So when you have the midges, the swarms of midges, you have gulls. And you have you know, large groups of gulls using the airport or using these areas where they're found. It's also well established that gulls are attracted to runways and taxiways when soil saturation forces earthworms onto, onto the pavement. And NWRC, our National Wildlife Research Center up here, has been looking at that as well to try to, to, to deal with that situation. But So after, after rain on an airport, just like at you know, the parking lot at Walmart, you've got worms on the pavement and it brings in, in birds. Well, that pavement happens to be a runway that aircraft need to be used, so that's definitely a conflict. Uh, we've also seen this with gulls, you know, gorging themselves on an abundance of uh, Japanese beetles. The picture on the right is of dead shad in open water um, in the wintertime near a warm water outlet from a utility company. So first off, you have open water when the lake is o iced over, and then you throw in the food source, and you end up with a resulting flock of uh, gulls, again, using this space that happens to be at the end of a runway. And then there are the very clear human-created food attractants, like taxi cab drivers feeding birds while they're in the taxi staging area, as the picture on the left, or simply the, from the food uh, and, and refuse that they, they leave behind that attracts the wildlife. Or it can be the, the obvious, the person that goes out and feeds you know, bags of food every morning to gulls, geese, and mallards in a nearby park that's uh, in the proximity of an airport. So where does an airport start when you have natural attractants like green space, drainage ditches, detention ponds, while also surrounded by your parks, waterways, landfills, wetlands, etc.? All these different things, and they're trying to run an airport. Where do they start to deal with this one small park that has significant events or significant results on an airport? As a wildlife professional, we know you can't manage for all species or that a bird isn't just a bird. It occupies a certain niche as food, food habitat. However, this may not be obvious to an airport, and they may not understand managing ducks is different than managing turkeys or vultures or raptors. So with limited resources, where do they focus their effort? Air, or focus their efforts, I'm sorry. When teaching airport personnel uh, during our training, I go through the following questions. What is being struck? What is the highest species of risk? So are, are you looking at... Uh, is that species, you know, based on the data resulting in damage or injury? What species are using the airport? And what I mean by that is what can you influence as, as airport personnel versus what is simply flying over that uh, you just have to be ready for? What, what is actually influencing the operations of the airport? And then the seasonal risk considerations, as I mentioned. As I mentioned, you should also consider what is the highest species of risk. So I, I, you know, I talked about damage and injury, but you use data, and that's why I talked about and spent time with the, the strike database and that information, the annual reports. We always try to emphasize the airports and our, and our wildlife folks that are working on airports is use that data that's out there. Knowledge is power. So this, this slide shows hazardous species ranking order based on several factors of damage and the effect on flight. Not all species are equal hazardous, and the focus should be on those species at the top of the list posing the greatest risk based on the data, the likelihood of damage. This table was put together by Dr. Richard Dolbeer, and it was originally published in the Wildlife Society Bulletin in 2000. Uh, it was actually updated in an FAA report in 2003. There are other rankings out there, but I want to use this one as an example. They're ranked 
25 species group, one being the most hazard, as to relative hazard to aircraft based on three criteria, damage, major damage, and effect on flight. The composite rankings based on all three rankings, and it, and it came up with a relative hazard score. And so depending on how you're looking at this, this is just to help an airport or wildlife professional use some information that's out there to prioritize with limited resources where your management efforts go. The other thing to take into consideration when you're making these decisions is not every airport's the same. And th this sometimes is difficult for, for our personnel that work on multiple airports. But you know, each, each has different aircraft, may have different types of operations. Uh, you know, passenger operations versus cargo operations are going to be differently. But you know, like the ecology of birds, I can't say the ecology of aircraft, but airport, the aircraft behave differently. They have different influences by different species. So military and civilian aircraft may differ in what wildlife is a higher risk. A larger passenger plane is different from a small regional jet, which is different from a small single engine product plane. And F-16 in the upper left picture is low slung. It's got a big air intake under its belly that acts as a big vacuum cleaner when it's going down the runway. So structurally, it may be able to take impact because it's a military aircraft. But what ingests a metal arc off the runway um, on takeoff, it can have significant results. So therefore, small songbirds may be a higher threat than other aircraft uh, when managing a, an airport or an airbase that's running C-130 operations versus fighter operations. So again, what is being struck and causing damage and relevant to what aircraft and operations the airport's conducting? So what can be done? What management, what techniques, procedures, what, what do you do about it? Uh, I ask the airport the following questions. Can it be removed? Can it be modified? Can it be excluded? Are you going to make a short-term temporary or a, a long-term permanent solution? What can be prevented? At the bottom line, there's no silver bullet. Every airport is different, and we know in wildlife damage management that you know an integrated approach is often the best result because we're talking about species that are highly adaptable, so they'll adapt to some techniques that you're doing. And again, I go back to the reason why it's there, I think, to, to start this process. I don't have time to go through a lot of this in depth, and again, this when we're doing a one to three courses, this is, this is a full day of talking about management techniques and stuff. So really what I'm just trying to do is highlight a few examples. This isn't the all-encompassing solution to wildlife, to managing wildlife on airport by any means. But this, this first slide I'm going to show here is to start from the reason why they're there. Can you simply remove the attractant? So rather than dealing with the species and temporarily trying to lethally remove it or trap it out of there, can you deal with the reason why it's there for, you know, as a more long-term solution? This is often difficult from, a, from an airport. It would be a lot simpler if you were in the planning stages and I could sit down with engineers and, and environmental firms that are when we're building an airport, when developing their master plan. We often inherit what's there, both airport operations and wildlife professionals. So, but if you can remove it, that's the best way to start. If, an example of the picture on the left, uh, when I talked about the canopy earlier that was drawing starlings in, well, the starlings would roost not just in the canopy, but it was such a large flock that they would use these dense surrounding trees that were in the area. So if we can cut down these trees, yes, it may not be the most beautiful or the first preferred uh, solution to the airport arc or the landscape architect that's working with the airport, but you know, removing the trees that they're, they're, they're foraging and removing uh, fruiting trees or, or something that's producing mass that just happens to be on an airport. Yeah, if we can remove that, then you know, it, it's a longer term solution. And the other thing is you know, many airports, especially small airports, uh, rely on, on agriculture, on, you know, on, on cropping on their airports to, uh, for income. And the picture on the right shows the obvious results. You know, if you've got, you know, if you're growing crops and you've got wildlife, in this case morning doves that have new, it can have significant results on your airport operations. And that, that's a picture from uh, Ohio. Resulted in $1.4 million worth of uh, damage lost for the aircraft. So if you can't remove it, can we at least make it a little bit less attractive to wildlife? And this is really where I want to highlight some, some efforts by NWRC up here in Sandusky. They've done a lot of research on grass management. You know, it's difficult enough for an airport to conduct its operations to get the maintenance crews out to, to just mow in addition to everything else they're doing. But, you know, 
how tall do you let your grass grow? Well, there's no silver bullet. There's no one answer fits all, but you just have to consider factors that may be obvious to us, but, you know, what species are you dealing with? Do they like tall? Are they, you know, are they, they like tall because that's what they nest in. They like tall grass because um, they prefer the cover. Do they like shorter grass because they, they want to be able to observe and look for predators, you know, that, and we all know that there's, there's different species like different types of, not only grass height, but grass density too, depending on why they're using it. But these are the factors you can put out, and, you know, NWRC breaks it down to, you know, is it species specific? Can you look at flock size? Can you look at the vegeta vegetation density and food abundance and availability of the grass? And one of the things that this research went into is also looking at the grass types. And so we talk about the mowing and the hat and the, on, on the left, the picture on the left, that a lot of times you just mow it, but uh, when you're mowing it, what, what height? But also I want to say before I go into grass type, I want to mention that there's also considerations because what happens when you mow or you hay something? You know, you're bringing in other, you know, whether it's vultures that are, you know, following one of the fields being cut for hay, or when you're mowing and you're kicking up insects and it's bringing in swallows. If those are the species of risk to the airport, well, then how can you modify that, those, that mowing regime? Can you do it at night under lights? Things like that. Well, then we get into um, in the picture on the right where NWC has uh, conducted 10 trials um, looking at the activity of geese in different types of grasses, different types of uh, varieties of turf grass in there. And that's where they, they've, they've really looked into making really, really valuable data that has gone into recommendations with the FAA and the airports with, with a lot of success. Now, it's difficult to reseed an entire airport to, to, you know, to kill off what's there and uh, plant it again with a, a fescue with a high end of fight. But, you know, but it's, it, it's a new project and it's new construction, we've got bare ground, this is really where we can make money with the airport by giving these recommendations following FAA guidelines, NWRC uh, using their data, and uh, help to alleviate those uh, wildlife attractiveness. So if you can't remove it, if you can't modify it, exclude it. And this, this may be an obvious slide, but, you know, excluding is less preferable because you still have the attractive that's being drawn in. They may come in, you know, wildlife may come in and then realize that they can't get to it, but they're still being drawn in and have, have impact on the airport's operations. So it's less preferred, but sometimes it's all you've got. For example, this isn't a very good picture. I'm going to, I can't do animations, but I'm going to show the, you know, little closer views in the next slide. But what it was, it's a, it was a pond that couldn't be removed, uh, and it was near an airport, but drew in significant amount of geese, hundreds of geese. And so the airport had tried hazing and harassment with little success. Well, a simple grid wire system, and if you're not familiar with that, I'll show this in the next slide. It doesn't necessarily exclude them, but the geese don't like it. And they, they put this up on a pond with, with great success. So just using, you know, I, you know, it's very strong fishing line, basically. Uh, you can get very expensive Kevlar braided lines and things like that, but I always suggest start, start simple with what's available and cheap and see if it'll work. But using tensioners to keep it, you know, off the water and T-posts. And then you can see on the picture on the right also putting up some sort of exclusion that's a barrier to prevent uh, waterfowl from, from walking in, not just flying in. But, you know, great results from this. This, this picture shows uh, exclusion of some canopies, as I mentioned earlier. Canopies, hangers, they offer perching and roosting solutions. First off, if we could plan these things before, we might use tubular steel versus I-beams that offers more perching, but we can't. We inherit these things. What do we do with what's there? So I tried, uh, the airport tried many different things, the bird distress calls, but uh, I'll talk about that later and with, uh, with harassment. But they, they didn't work. They tried removing the trees. Well, the birds still, these starlings still like these canopy. Well, they, they put in a, a very good, I had a company come and do a very good job with exclusion that really kept it to just a few birds that could kind of creep in on some of the corners as the picture on the right. But uh, they excluded this whole area and really reduced the starling use of, uh, of a canopy. Also, exclusion in the form of fence. Most fence on airports is for security, for human-type security purposes, and not necessarily for deer. But anyone who knows fencing knows that a deer can, uh, our whitetails can clear a very 
high fence. So the FAA has uh, formal recommendations on this that include you know, a, a 10 foot fence, a 10 foot, they call it a deer proof fence, but using skirting so that it's buried to avoid uh, the situation on the left and especially ground heave in, in northern Ohio when it's, it's you know, moving post and pulling the fences creeping up off the ground, but also has, you know, barbed out riggers on the top for security purposes. Well, that's fine if you're building a new fence, but for existing fence, um, it often has to be modified. And this can be a significant effort from a maintenance crew that we're also trying to get out to conduct certain types of mowing or vegetation. So this was, the picture on the right is just a really a great job that an airport in northern Ohio did with retrofitting a fence and just adding some skirting, digging it out, adding some skirting to prevent coyotes from getting under there, creating corridors for deer and everything else to move under. Also the thing that we've seen is, you know, an airport will spend a lot of money on a fencing project, but then they put it at the, the base of a hill, so something's jumping on the airport. They don't understand the principles of, of the fencing, or that contractor doesn't. So it's a, very important that when you're, you're putting um, money into these projects that they're done right and that you're, you're offering information as they go so it's not done wrong. Uh, of course, we all know that you can't keep everything out, even Kyle's a climb a fence if you haven't seen it or heard of it, that's what the picture on the left is of, so a lot of good the skirting did on that 10-foot fence. But the bottom line is wildlife will adapt and they'll find a way. And if they don't, then you've got the picture on the right of, of human error. You know, you leave the gate a little bit open or security, you know, doesn't maintain that gate. Uh, and we've seen that on airports. So the most expensive fence doesn't always work. And, of course, you can't exclude birds from airports. So that's what, you know, we get into harassment. And this is often what airport personnel resort to for most species and why we as well as biologists are so important dealing with the other things I mentioned, the removal and modification exclusion of the attractants. Propane exploders and even bird distress sound systems can be effective. But um, as I mentioned earlier in that canopy, the airport had put up bird distress systems. But the problem is you, you have to move these things or change the timing or change them or turn them off. Otherwise, they adapt to it, as anyone in nuisance wildlife understands. They'll adapt, and then there's there's no there's no repellent factor in there. You're not you're not keeping it off. So uh, I always suggest, well, you know, if you've got a sound system out, once it gets rid of, you know, once the birds move off, turn it off. You know, reinforce that neophobic response by you know making it new every time something shows up, or move it, turn it off, adjust it. For pyrotechnics, in the right picture, you know, there are uh, regulations for this because they are considered a, an explosive and recent um, restrictions have, have limited some use of this, but it's a very effective tool. But the FAA requires that airport personnel um, are trained on the use of pyrotechnics because it is an effective tool in dealing with the wildlife that end up on the airport. And, and sometimes I'll jump to the picture on the right, and sometimes with removal of a species, lethal removal can, is used to reinforce some of the, the, the harassment techniques. If geese aren't responding to, you know, we, we know this, but, if, you know, an airport may not. If, if geese aren't responding to the harassment or, the, you know, they're not showing as great, well, then if you leave or remove a few, it's going to enhance those techniques. And it's required by federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Depredation per Permits for airports as well, is that they're using lethal removal as, uh, to reinforce harassment for many species. But additionally, you know, sometimes you, you can't do anything with these species. They show up. Um, and you result in having to, to, to trap and remove things or lethal remove from things. So consider the lethal reinforcement, as I mentioned. And this, this may not be an option for, for some species and not the first option and may be temporary. But again, it is something that sometimes is on an airport. So with that, talking about species, that this isn't an option. Or we as wildlife professionals know that it's not the first option um, to reduce that threat. So. Some species have their own permits, special procedures that require collaboration with the state. Again, the airport may not understand this, though it may be very obvious to us. So I'm going to use peregrine falcons as an example of this and, and discuss trap and relocate because I, I want to – trap and relocate doesn't make sense for deer, geese, starlings, etc. But for some species, our threatened and endangered species at, at federal and state level, uh, those species that we can do this with, it's a very important tool, and we use it successfully. But obviously, peregrine falcons are a state threatened species, and they're flagship species in our, in our state. Uh, 
the picture on the left is, you know, from Cleveland. They they like urban areas, tall buildings, tall bridges. As, as the picture on the right shows, that's where they they nest. And uh, these structures are near airports, as I mentioned earlier, near metropolitan areas. So as an example of this, we had two peregrines in, in 2004. We had two peregrines that showed up using two different airports in one city. And they had a juvenile at each airport. Uh, Wildlife Services work with airport operation personnel, utilize our techniques, sirens, horns, whatever. They're peregrine falcons, so we, we want to be careful with the things we're doing. But at, after about 20 minutes of intense harassment, they would just they would just habituate to it, and they would just show up. And we saw there was definitely a difference with the juvenile peregrines than with the adults. But the juveniles were not responding. But what I want to explain, though, is less than three days after initial sightings at both airports, the air, uh, these birds were struck by aircraft and killed in separate incidents. So within three days, two separate airports, separate incidents, juvenile peregrines uh, were, were, were killed within three days. So obviously that is not good for the aircraft, the people on the aircraft that are striking them. But as I mentioned before, the peregrines aren't surviving. And obviously this is a, a species of, you know, that we spend a certain amount of time and effort. It's a very important species to us as wildlife professionals. So we we'll deal with, you know, situations like this. Well. We worked with the, with the Division of Wildlife in this case, and we sat down and said, hey, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do to protect the peregrine falcons while protecting health and human safety, especially in this consideration, as I mentioned, with an airport that just has to follow federal regulations and respond to hazardous wildlife on an airport. And, and peregrines are hazardous to aircraft. It's a large bird that's being ingested in an aircraft um, with significant results. So. In 2005, we established a, a peregrine falcon relocation plan for airports, and um, it, it involved, you know, a, a plan that the, the Division of Wildlife and State we, we agreed on and what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, but what were our criteria to be able to trap and relocate um, the birds using various techniques, and then coordinating with the Division of Wildlife for banding and release. Well, well, this plan expanded as we dealt with more and more raptors on an airport. To 2009, we established a, a, a live trap and relocation problem for programmatic raptors and, and owls, and it, it grew to a statewide plan that we just renewed with the Division of Wildlife in 2013. The, the picture I show in the, the lower right there is, uh, we call them bumblebee bands, but they're, they're the bands that we use when we're relocating raptors off an airport to identify that it's been, been, been caught on an airport. For Red tails, we are very common hawks. We try this effort because you can put, we are certified with use of pole traps. We have permits through the Fish and Wildlife Service. We've got approvals through the state. Um, and why I highlight this is because airport personnel often don't. So this may not be an option for airport personnel, but it can be a successful uh, option when you're dealing with bald eagle or peregrine falcon or state species. Um, you have a plan, work with your cooperators on this, and we have moved many birds. For red tails, if the return, it's still in there. We do our best to try and tra trap and relocate at a certain time of year where it's less likely to return, but those birds may need to be lethally removed. For birds like peregrine falcons, you're going to continue to put the efforts into trying to uh, trap and relocate and work with the state on those things. So we now have multiple species in this plan. It has been successful. We've caught many where we have full-time wildlife biologists at airports, or we are working with airports with, with staff hours. It's been a pretty successful tool. But what I want to show in the, the next slide is this is a federal memorandum of, agree, of agreement for aviation safety. But before I get into the federal side, I, I really just think the most important thing is when we're talking about the complexities of these issues, is the successes are really shown by the airport and those wildlife professionals working with all parties involved so that it is a plan that is the most sensible to address health and human safety, but to address also, you know, the welfare of, of the wildlife that are there, because that's, that's our responsibility as wildlife professionals uh, as well. So the, the key for success is really collaborative efforts by multiple agencies to, to address this. So this slide specifically talks about a memorandum of agreement, and it's, it's between the, the FAA, the Air Force, the Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, Fish and Wildlife Service, and U.S. Department of Agriculture to address air, aircraft wildlife strikes. Because let's face it, when an airport is being told by the FAA that you have a species that is hazardous to aircraft on your airport, you need to do something about it and they go to do something about it, and we recommend that you deal with the attractant, 
and they see the attractant as a wetland, and they go through have to go through a, a wetland mitigation with the Corps of Engineers or or the Ohio EPA, depending on how that goes. But and when you're needing a permit to do this, you need a permit to deal with the species that are there. You know, there's a lot of conflicting missions, goals, priorities between those different agencies, and that's not even getting into the state and local government. That's at a federal level. So this memorandum of agreement basically says, hey, everybody needs to sit down and consider this as health and human safety, and we need to work through this process and come up with a, with a good plan. And this really highlights that, again, at the state level, sitting down with a raptor relocation plan or a bald eagle plan, which is what we've developed with an airport uh, that we may have to potentially trap and relocate a bald eagle uh, from an airport. But to have those plans ready uh, so that you can deal with these things with everybody's input. And why I, I uh, want to kind of wrap this up with this is because the success of this is going back into even getting these people involved in planning when an airport has construction projects, airport expansion projects, we are often asked by the FAA to review plans and whether it's simply having input in a detention basin that is required as of impervious surfaces from taxiways and runways on an airport that hey, can you put some input in there? What is the, you know, we've got great Blue Heron problems. Can you change the slope of this working with the architects or the engineers? Can you change the, the grade? Can you change the, the substrate, the material? If you're going to plant grass on it, then, you know, what are, what are the requirements? What type of grass? If not, can you grid these things off, again, with the canopy? One, one example here to, to kind of wrap this up is there was a, a tower being built on, a, on an airport that we worked at, and the architects for the tower were looking at, you know, how best to run an air traffic control tower. What they weren't looking at is, hey, if you put this very tall structure on an area where we know we have peregrines in high use, you're, you're putting ledges, window ledges, window sills in this thing that are perfect habitat for peregrines that, you know, if there was anywhere else, we'd put a camera on it and have school kids naming the birds and, and we'd track them and be a great thing. But an airport, not so much. So we worked with them to adjust the slope of those so that they were less attractive to, uh, you know, nesting peregrines. And around the tower, what does everyone want to do? A landscape architect comes in and wants to plant, you know, things that look beautiful that if we were in another situation, we will want to be attractive and plant native species, native fruiting, you know, species that, you know, forage um, producing species. But on an airport, that's, that's not what you want. And, you know, in a perfect world, it would be, it would be completely pavement, which would be the opposite of what we say as a wildlife management. But it's the least attractive, but that's not, not possible. So the bottom line is that the keys to success are working together, using the data, and really trying to be proactive and not reactive in these situations where you can't. Because the bottom line, as we like to say, it, you know, it's a bit cheesy sometimes, but really it, it is safer skies for all who fly. It's not just the flying public, the federal the regulations that are out there um, to deal with, it, with, the, with these, um, these threats to human health and safety, but, you know, it's also about the wildlife because it's not good for them to be struck by an airport uh, as well. So with that, I will uh, put it up for uh, questions if anybody has any. But uh, before I actually, before I say that, I just wanted to thank you all for your time and then uh, also for this, this opportunity to sh uh, share this, this information. Well, thank you very much, John. That was a very informative uh, presentation. For, if anybody has any questions, you can type them in the chat bar at the bottom left of your screen. Um, and I do have one question for you, John, uh, and I'm not sure if you can answer it. Do you, do you have an idea of how many um, um, strikes, wildlife strikes, you have prevented by, by um, putting these biologists at each of the airports? It's really difficult to assess that, you know, in that environment. Um, I'm sure you could look at it in an airport to see what the, the change is. I don't have it at the, the top of my you know, off the top of my head right here. We have shown results. We have shown um, that there are, we can reduce the, the number of strikes. And, and, and sometimes that's what an airport and what the FAA officials will look at is just simply the number of strikes. But for instance, I can tell you we put a full-time airport biologist out and they did what they could to work through the priority list as I mentioned. And then an airport that conducts an expansion project and 
starts expanding a runway and doesn't have any consideration and surprise you've got what we call construction birds but it's it's those you know those birds that really like open bare ground as you can do in a construction project so that factor may influence the number of strikes really I think it's important to look at again those what strikes are using and if it's red tail hawks we've got data where on an airport where we put effort into it with full-time airport biologists and spend time in dealing with raptors or candy geese or deer that we've shown those strikes have you know significantly been reduced and you know we've got data to, to show that but I just want to you know caveat that with there are also the unknown factors it's the, it's the the migratory bird flying over that you you know and I tell this to airports that you you can't it's, it's really hard to do anything about that other than trying to follow FAA safety guidelines with a five-mile safety zone around an airport where you're working with, um, you know, those landowners or those, those, those governments to have that influence in the surrounding area. I see a question here. Yeah, this winter there were so many snowy owls in the area, often reported in the airports. Any issues dealing with them this winter? Significant issues nationwide. There has been, you know, an eruption of snowy owls. I've been told it's because they just had a really great breeding year up north and there was a great prey base, and we have seen significant amount of snowy owls. And even requests to say, hey, can we use this as a bird survey point? Well, that's, that's not going to, it's going to definitely influence your survey because we're going to harass anything that shows up. So, you know, we can say it was there, but you're not going to get much observation on it. So we don't want it there. But yeah, I can tell you, we have struck snowy owls in Ohio at multiple airports. We have seen significant numbers of snowy owls at, at, at airports in Ohio, and it's a significant concern uh, nationally. Really cool stuff as a wildlife biologist, you know, and you, you, you know, you get to go out and see a snowy owl, but again, not at an airport. But yeah, snowy owls have been a, a, a big concern nationally and in Ohio. Thank you again for uh, the presentation today. Uh, really appreciated it. And thank you everybody who logged in to, to watch it. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.